Hi, so I'm going to talk about um, some books from Richard Elliott Friedman. This is Who Wrote the Bible? And this is a really good book. Um, on my resources page on the website, there's a link where you can uh, get it for free if you, it's like a library thing where you have to actually like sign up to get the next one. And, you know, other than that, you can buy um, a used copy online for a pretty low price, I believe. So, in this book, he talks about the documentary uh, theory or hypothesis um, about how the original text of the Bible was written by different people, and they just sort of spliced it together. That's why there's two different um, Eden stories about, you know, whether God created animals first or after man. Um, I just saw somebody on Facebook trying to say, there's not a contradiction, there's not a contradiction. Well, this would explain why there is a contradiction. Uh, two different stories got meshed together in one in the Bible. In this book, um, The Hidden Book in the Bible, he talks about how once you get rid of that extraneous stuff that's been added to it, there's actually a big story. He's suggesting that there's this big story that was written by somebody back then, and it goes throughout the Bible, but we have so much stuff added to it, you can't even see that in the Bible. So that's why he calls this the hidden book in the Bible, and it's in here. Um, you can see there's a different colorization for that portion of it. So then you can actually read it in this book without the extraneous stuff that he's trying to take out. Of course, this is his belief. Um, but he's got some really interesting thoughts. And so at the beginning, it talks about that and sort of why he came to this conclusion that it was one writer who wrote this long story that just got separated into different sections in our Bible. So I was going to read a little bit of that, um, but not the whole thing. And so you can find this book online. I'll leave links below for everything. So I'm just going to start on page 15. First, I found that the very texts in which these chains of common wording occur connect to each other in order. So he's talking about the common wording that's found throughout the text and trying to say that this is a, this is a sort of proof that this was written by the same person because there's common wording found throughout. And it would be a little weird if you had different people writing the same style and same vocabulary as the other writers. So. Anyway, he's talking about those chains of common wording that connect each other, each different parts um, together in order. When we separate this group of texts and read it through, we discover that it is more than a collection of stories with a great amount of common language. It is a continuous account. Where one text leaves off, the next text that has some of the common wording picks up the story. So, for example, in the last J passages in the Pentateuch, so J would stand for Jehovah or the Yahweh passages. Um, like I said, you can see the documentary hypothesis um, video from Brad Brink on the David Hanotsuri channel, or you know, the um, the page on our website talks about that um, that documentary hypothesis. There's links for more information on that. Anyway, so it says so for example, and some of the common wording, some of the common wording picks up the next story. So, for example, in the last J passages in the Pentateuch, the people of Israel are located at a place called Shittim, Numbers 25.1. And Shittim is where they are located at the beginning of the book of Joshua, at the point where the common language begins, Joshua 2.1. Likewise, the conclusion of Judges connects to the beginning of Samuel B, the next text that has the familiar wording. And Samuel B then flows integrally into the court history which depends on it for the introduction into the narrative of a number of the central persons in the story, including King David's wives, his generals, and his priests. The end of each section thus connects to the beginning of the next, with one exception, which I'll discuss later. Second, sometimes the density of these overlapping terms in specific stories is far too great for explanation by simple chance or expected patterns of distribution. Compare. For example, the two stories I mentioned earlier are brothers avenging a sexual violation of their sister. The J story of Dina and Shechem, found in Genesis 34. 
and the court history story of Amnon and Tamar found in 2 Samuel 13. Look at the clusters of language in these two stories. In 2 Samuel, Amnon takes Tamar and he degraded her and he lay with her, 2 Samuel 13, 14. In Genesis, Shechem takes Dina and he lay with her and he degraded her, Genesis 34, 2. In 2 Samuel, Tamar tells Amnon, such a thing is not done in Israel and don't do this foolhardy thing, 2 Samuel 13, 12. In Genesis, Dina's brothers are upset with Shechem, are upset because Shechem had done a foolhardy thing in Israel and such a thing is not done. So, such a thing is not done in Israel, don't do this foolhardy thing. Had done a foolhardy thing in Israel and such a thing is not done. These two stories, they're using the same sort of language. Tamar says that it would be a disgrace for her, 2 Samuel 13, 13. Dina's brothers say that mixing with the uncircumcised men of Shechem city would be a disgrace. Genesis 34, 14. Absalom tells Tamar, keep quiet, 2 Samuel 13, 20. Dina's father, Jacob, keep quiet, Genesis 34, 5. The man who degrades Tamar dies violently at the hands of her brother. The man who degrades Dina dies violently at the hands of her brothers. Tamar's father, David, knows but is passive. His son takes vengeance and he is angry afterward, 2 Samuel 13, 21. Dina's father, Jacob, Knows but is passive, his brothers take vengeance and he is angry afterward. Genesis 34 30. The parallels to the court histories Amnon and Tamar episode come elsewhere in Jay as well, not just in the Dina and Shechem story. As I've noted, Jay, or the Jehovah one, has a Tamar also, the ancestor of the latter Tamar. Both are stories about sexual relations within, within a family. Revenge is taken for the court histories Tamar. When they are shearing, 2 Samuel 13, 24. Revenge is taken for Jay's Tamar when they are shearing, Genesis 38, 12. In the court history, Tamar, the innocent victim of violence by her brother, wears a coat of many colors, which is torn, 2 Samuel 13, 18. In Jay, Joseph, the innocent victim of violence by his brothers, wears a coat of many colors, which is torn, Genesis 37, 3, 23, and 32. And recall that these are the only occurrences of the coat of many colors in the Hebrew Bible. In this court history, David mourned over his son's son all the days, 2 Samuel 13, 37. In J, Jacob mourned over his son many days, Genesis 37, 34. Here is an even more striking case. In the famous J story of Sodom and Gomorrah, two travelers who happen to be angels arrive in Sodom. Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, shows them the hospitality, but the people of Sodom surround the house and demand that he send the guests out to the crowd. In a story that is found in the text that I identified in the book of Judges, some travelers, a man and his concubine, arrive in a city in Benjamin. One man shows them hospitality, but the people of the city surround the house and demand that he send the guests out to the crowd. In Genesis, Lot says to the angels, turn and spend the night. Genesis 19.2. In Judges, the travelers turn to spend the night. Judges 19.15. In Genesis, the angel's answer, we'll spend the night in the square, verse 2. In Judges, the old man says, don't spend the night in the square, verse 20. And uh, in Genesis, Lot pressed, Hebrew root PSR, the men to spend the night, verse 3. In Judges, the concubine's father is pressed, concubine's father pressed his son-in-law to spend the night, verse 7. Genesis says they came to his house, verse 3. Judges says, and he had him come to his house, verse 21. In Genesis, Lot offers the visitors the washing of feet, verse 2. In Judges 2, they wash their feet, verse 21. In Genesis, the people of the city surrounded the house, verse 4. In Judges, the people of the city surrounded the house, verse 22. The people of Sodom tell Lot, bring them out to us and let us know them, verse 5. In Judges, the people say, bring out the man and let's know him, verse 22. In Genesis, Lot goes out to talk to the crowd, and Lot went out to talk to them. Verse 6, in Judges, the old man goes out to the crowd, and the man went out to them. Verse 23, Lot pleads with the crowd, don't do bad, my brothers. Verse 7, the old man pleads, don't, my brothers, don't do bad. Verse 23, Lot offers his virgin daughters to the crowd. Verse 8, the old man offers his virgin daughter to the crowd. Verse 24, Lot delays. Verse 16, the man and the concubine and judges delay. Verse 8. 
It should be getting obvious that there is something going on here that is more than an editor with an eraser and a pencil, and there is further evidence that it is something pervasive that is happening. There are at least five sets of these parallel stories that have dense clusters of common terminology spread throughout this connected group of texts. They offer all across the group in J. Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, and 2 Samuel. In the past, we have explained such parallels by saying that one author imitated another, or that one author was influenced by the actual history reflected in the other story, or that both authors used common formulas from old oral traditions, or that an editor reconciled the two stories. But none of these solutions will work when we take all of the other evidence into account as well. All five of these sister stories were part of a continuous, connected history, and that history repeatedly used words and phrases that occurred nowhere else.